Grace and love, as we come before you this day, we ask that you would once again enlighten our hearts, bless our souls, grant us your spirit, and guide us according to your will. We are thankful, Lord, that you are a God of mercy and wonder, who touches our hearts and enlightens us so that we, in turn, can be a blessing in the lives of others. So we ask that you would guide all that we do, as we look to you in the in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake, who gives us all our sins. To those who believe in his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. The intro for this morning are selected verses from Psalm 2. We do read these verses. Repeat. I have installed my King on Zion, my holy hell. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. As to me, and I will make a nation to your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like the iron. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you <coughs> rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice the time of God. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment.
gave to the people of Israel the most amazing demonstration, illustration, right before their eyes. He, he did something that was to prepare them, to show them the remarkable difference between the gods of Egypt and who the true God was. And he laid out before them this set of incredible pictures and happenings that should have overwhelmed them with an understanding of just how precious they were before his eyes and what he desired to give them. It is a remarkable text to show how far God went to make Israel understand who he really was. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God, and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron, and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like the devouring fire on the top of the mountain in sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. The best lesson is found in 2 Peter, the first chapter, it begins with verse 16. When Peter wrote, he was always trying to point people to the reality of why they could trust in the Word of God. Not his Word, but in the Father's Word. And he shows once again how Personally, the Father is involved to make sure that we have the exact word of our God. For we do not follow cleverly devised myths when we make known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns, and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Would you please rise to the reading of the Holy Gospel? The Holy Gospel is found in the 17th chapter of Matthew. It begins with verse 1. Over and over again, the Lord relays to his people his teaching of grace. And where grace leads us to understand and to share. It is an amazing text, this text is, to show, again, how personal the Father in heaven is for his people, so they will grasp the wondrous truth that he desires for them to gain. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, 
One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Here ends the Holy Gospel. Would you please join me in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 192. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Then 
God revealed his power by bringing these clouds over the mountain. And it was an overwhelming display of the power of God. And then it was six days that it lasted. But on the seventh day, everything changed and he invited Moses up. The God of creation to a people who were to know the story of creation. <clears throat> we're given six days where the power of God was demonstrated and then there was a peace on the seventh. And it was to point them to this was the God, the creator of the world, the only true God. Everything set in motion. Moses went then up on the mountain for 40 days so that God could reestablish with his people that he was renewing and restoring and recreating them. And every time 40 takes place, it was demonstrating that this was in the hands of God and no one could change it. He laid out everything so remarkably well so that they could understand what the grace of God was all about. Now we have Christ coming to the world. And again the text says, and six days later. On the seventh day, the Lord asked them to ascend the mountain. It was to reflect to the disciples, to everyone who was a believer, that the creating God was now once again with his people, and he's walking up the mountain. And when that creating God walked up the mountain with his disciples, and the disciples were worn out so they were resting, the Father in heaven sent two men, men that every Israelite person would know, Moses and Elijah. <coughs> Moses is the lawgiver, the one chosen by God to free his people from Egypt, the one who was given the right to behold God face to face and yet not die. Moses was given this remarkable gift of being the leader of his people, but we know that Moses was anything but perfect. He was a sinful man. Hence, when he came to visit the Lord, he wasn't shining. Elijah came. Elijah was a very unique man. He was chosen by God. He could do everything God asked. He was determined, but he was also a man of depression. He would have highs and he would have lows and he would be all excited that he would get cleared down and he would reflect over and over again how helpless he was. And yet God kept bringing him along because it wasn't about Elijah. But Elijah was to reflect the grace of God to his people. And so Elijah did miraculous things and raised people from the dead and did all kinds of amazing things. But then he said, God, I can't do this anymore. Just take me. And God did. It took me to heaven a while. But Elijah was not shining eye. The creating God would come to join his people it was revealed to the disciples and the Shown like the sun. And this overwhelming discussion was taking place with them because God had sent Moses and Elijah down to the Lord to have a discussion about this walk to the cross. Now, in the midst of this, we have this guy named Peter. Peter has no clue. Peter never has a clue, but Peter's always going to be willing to speak. I can see this. This is how I see the situation. If I was invited to the inauguration of the president, and I'm sitting right down here, right when he's starting to give his... Yes. <laughs> right when the president's going, when the man says, I follow this five values, and I would stand up and go, Hey! Hey, Mr. President! Do you want a Pepsi? <laughs> because Peter, in the midst of all of this, goes, Lord, Lord, you want me to build you a building? Now, I would have loved to see Jesus' face. But Jesus didn't say a word to Peter. Guess who did? The Father. The Father, in the most amazingly gracious way, told Peter to be quiet. He said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. To first of all tie Peter and the other disciples back to what took place at Jesus' baptism. And then he said these three words that were to change their lives. Listen to him. When the father spoke and he said, listen to him, the three disciples fell on their face on the ground. 
they were done. They knew they were done. They were in the presence of the Almighty God and overwhelmed them. But then God's grace came through. Jesus comes up, touches them on the shoulder, and says, It's okay, stand up, no fear. But there's one thing you cannot do. You can't tell anybody about what you saw. Not until after I rise. Because it wasn't about what they saw so that they could share. It was about honoring the Father. They were to honor the Father because of the grace that He was offered. They were to make sure that they kept their focus on what it was to have God focused right here as the most important part of their life. And that they were not important. This is a lesson that God teaches all of us. And the most amazingly important aspect of anyone who is alive on this earth is that we believe and we hold honor to the Father in heaven. That he is the major focus of everything that we do. That he is more important than anything else that we do. One of the things they did in the Old Testament, which has always amazed me, and it's talked about at the beginning of the Old Testament text, was they would slap, they would, they would cut the jugular of the lamb, and they would drain it all in, in, in a bowl, and then they would come into the meta presence of people and like it's And so everybody would get a little blood clapped in their face. Pretty excited, aren't you? And aren't you glad we live in a day and age where we don't have to be slapped in the face by blood from the lamb? Because we have a different context. We have the grace of the Father coming upon us through His Son, and He's applied His blood in His death and resurrection upon each of us in baptism so that we have this remarkable blessing of righteousness and holiness. We don't have to be hit in the face by the blood. We have been covered in cleansed by His blood. So that we can have a central focus in our life that nothing matters more than our faith. There are so much emphasis we put into this world. There are so many things that we do for our children. But the one thing that we can never miss is the most important thing we do for our children. We focus them on the one and only God. The Father in Heaven who loves them so deeply through His Son and when the Spirit touches their heart. This is the most important factor in their lives. If I love my children, and I do, if I love my children with just everything that I have, all the love and the energy and effort and wisdom and anything I can gain. If I love my children, all they gain is my love, big deal. As a believer, I understand that not only am I able to love them with everything that I am, I love them with something that I am not. I love them with the holiness of God because that's what he gives me the right to love them as well. And if I have an option of loving them just with my own or I'm going to love them with the love of God, the love of God just overwhelms me like crazy and brings to them blessings I can never bring them. Teaching them the principles that God has given is more important than anything because it is what will carry them into eternity. Honoring God, understanding the wonder of what grace has enabled us to do. Not only to understand and look to Him and be trusting in Him, but we are enveloped in Him. So that every day of our life we have this remarkable gift given to us, it's called forgiveness. And it makes it so that we have this enormous blessing to share with those we love the most. But nothing has more value in our life than our faith. And nothing has more importance in the lives of our fellow believers and children. God is a God of grace. He goes to such extent so that we have an understanding of the importance that He holds in our life. Again, He shows us by example all the time. You know, He did everything with the people of Israel. He gave these leaders all this vision. And they walked down from the mountain. And within 20 days, they're arguing about why they need to build a cow in order to worship because that's really freed them from Egypt. These were not bright people. Either are we. That's why he says, understand the importance of keeping the focus of the Father in front of your children, in front of yourself, in front of each other. Because with his love, he will carry us through everything. But with our own love, we won't. 
who I like God, he is just so simplistic so that we can't help but miss what he has done and what he is so willing to continue to do. May God in his mercy always lead us to hold unto his truths. And may we always hold up in the forefront of all things.
And as your people, we are privileged to turn to you once again in the prayer that your Son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant to you his eternal peace.